It's his criminal profiler, Pat Brown, and you guys have to tell me if you can hear me because my mic seems to be having an issue. So let me find out if you can hear and see me. And if you can hear me, do I sound like I'm hardly there? Because there's something really weird going on here. So do let me know. <laughs> Lisa says she's getting a new router Tuesday. Yes, I am. Um, Okay, can you, okay, thank you. I'm glad you can see and hear me. Do I sound normal? Because the mic volume is almost non-existent on my, yo. See, it is quiet. What the devil? What am I supposed to do about that? How weird. How about now? Is it getting any better? Any better? I don't want to be, uh... yeah. Okay, hold on a second. Let me see if I can fix this. It's really annoying. Yeah, I can, I can hardly see it working at all. Okay, let me... I think my mic just died. <laughs> Great. That's so nice. Okay, let's see if I can try something else and see if it works. Uh, uh... This. How are you hearing me now? Is it, is, it, is it better now? Or not better? You had to turn it up a lot. Okay, I've changed my mic. Is it better or worse? Oh, it's great now? Really? Huh. Okay. I just see see my nice mic. Apparently it's not working today. So now I'm on a on the camera mic, which you're not supposed to be on. But <laughs> Oh, you know, here we go again with no matter what you do, you get one thing fixed, you get another problem. So just love live. Okay, everybody. <clears throat> You can hear, you can see me. We'll go with that and uh, maybe I can turn even my sound up. Okay. Yeah, let me try that. I don't know if it's going to work, but okay. I want you to be able to hear me. Otherwise, the show is kind of pointless. So, yes, it was a professional mic. It was. It's a good mic. And all of a sudden, it just wasn't registering. So, I don't know what happened. So, <laughs> Molly says, nothing can silence Pat. Many people have said that. <laughs> if it goes really bad, I can't Okay, if you don't sign, you, you know, it wouldn't help you. <laughs> All right, so better, we're going to go with that then. All right, <sighs> so anyway, today we're going to do two cases. Um, we're going to do Krista Worthington, and we're going to do Linda Silva. These are cases almost nobody has heard about unless they live in Cape Cod or are true, 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 true crime fans, especially the Linda Silva case, which got almost no, no uh, really any kind of uh, publicity outside of Cape Cod. Krista got more because she once was quite a well-known writer for the fashion world. So, yes. Yeah, so, oh, hello, everybody. Benny is here. Doreen's here. The two Lisas are here. Florence is here. Molly's here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Who else is here? Joe's here. And uh, Martin's here. And Florence is here. And Anne is here. Two Anne's are here. And Haley and Anne, the other Anne. And let's see. Anybody else? Uh, the Lisas, Lisas. And Kathleen. Oh, wow. Great, great group. Great group. Um, Molly. Did I say Molly already? Fantastic. This is my wonderful group of patrons. If you say, why didn't I get to come to this live show and participate in the chat room? It's because the, the live part is only for Patreon people, uh, levels three, four, and five. I did that to get rid of the bots and the, the haters and the trolls in the chat room, and it's been wonderful since I've done that. So you can always see the videos for free on YouTube, but if you want to participate in the conversation during the show, the live part, please go below, click on uh, Patreon, and, uh, and join. And it helps support the channel because I'm heavily demonetized by YouTube, and if we want this channel to continue, I need help. So anyway, also, if you like the video, please do like, please do subscribe to the channel. That's totally free. So if you're on a budget, you can still do that and help us, help me out a lot. Okay, so let's go to the, <laughs> Doreen says, I didn't do any homework. It's okay. Um, I did the homework for you. So um, there are going to be longer explanations on the internet, um, and I'm going to show you a couple of them that you can look into. There's almost nothing on um, on Linda Silva, so don't even waste your time trying to find that. But there are two books, um, no, sorry, there's two books and there's a movie on Krista. Um, there's this, there's this uh, book called Invisible Eden, 
don't buy it. I'm sorry, lady. Uh, uh, you know, um, I know you worked hard on this. Um, I bought your book. Uh, it was so verbose. I uh, just couldn't, couldn't get through the style of writing. There was almost nothing about the homicide. Uh, it was almost all about Krista's tiny little details of life and the tiny little details of Cape Cod. Perhaps if I were a Cape Cod resident, I'd love this book to death. I returned it to Amazon and got my money back. So I wouldn't recommend that unless you're really into Cape Cod history and lots of um, flowery type of writing so didn't work for me so um there is a there is a show it's called killing on the cape um that um was done by abc you can find that um it is uh, available uh for free um so you can see that uh it's pretty well done um it's got some interesting stuff in it that i'm going to be talking about which i might not agree with but uh, at least a relatively well done show Okay, and then there is one more book. Um, it is called um, It is called Reasonable Doubt, and I, and before, I don't want to get into why there's a reasonable doubt until the end, end of uh, what I want to discuss about Krista. Okay, so those are the those are the things I use to gather my information, along with well, lots of other sources. So let's go find out who Krista is, so that you can get an idea of her. Um, I mean, let me read a little bit about the case. I'm going to break this up because this is very important. What I really want to talk about today is the issue of suspects and scenarios. Um, you know, a lot of times when you go to a true crime channel, they'll tell you the story. Now they'll throw all the suspects in and then they'll come, huh, here's what happened, or here, we don't believe it, or we think they got the wrong guy, or whatever it is. But I want to talk about the issues surrounding actually working on cases where you've got a number of suspects and time goes by and you haven't actually got a conclusion. Um, you haven't actually arrested anybody. Eventually in both these cases there were suspects arrested and convicted. So I'm going to get to that as to how they came up with these suspects, what they convicted them on, and how much I agree with the convictions. All right, so Krista Worthington. Let's look at Krista. Um, she, I mean, let me pull up a little picture about her. There you go. All right. She was a United States fashion writer who worked for Women's Wear Daily, Cosmopolitan, Elle, Harper's Bazaar, and the New York Times. She was also co a co-author of several books on fashion and formerly dated Stan Stuk Stukowski, the oldest son of Gloria Vanderbilt, and she also did also oh, the oldest son of Gloria. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So she's she had. Um, quite a fancy life. She, you know, parents were really well-known people. Um, they had relatively good amount of money. My parents did come from Cape Cod and they were the big wigs there. Um, then she moved, she went to, you know, uh, great, great university. She went to, you know, she was all over the world. She was, she was quite something in her day. Um, and she was, and, and she was a good writer. I'll give her that too. Um, <laughs> much as I just was not too nice about the other kind of writing I just talked about. Um, this is her in her heyday, and one of the ladies in the show, uh, the the, the uh, documentary, read this particular statement, and it was talking about a scarf, the head, the head scarf reveals as it conceals. The louder you, the go away message, the more audible the come hither. You know, and she was pointing out how beautiful that was. And, and I agree, she's an absolutely excellent writer, and she was huge in the fashion world. So how'd she end up on Cape Cod? You know, and how'd she end up dead on Cape Cod is the question. All right, so apparently what happened is over time, she had had a lot of that world, and she kind of wanted to settle down, and she wanted to have a baby. And if you read what it says on the right here, it says, there is at the moment no father for a child of mine, no husband for me. And what if there never is? I have to stare the scenario in the face. And to my surprise, it hasn't killed me. But if you look on the left side, she goes on Lisa and she says hmm, she wants to have a baby, even though she's not married. And this actually is something she goes out to pursue. Uh, and so what she does is she returns to where her family comes from, which is Cape Cod. Okay, and this is the beautiful area of Cape Cod that she's, she's gone to. And in case you don't know much about uh, the... It, it, Cape Cod is in nor, uh, the northeast of the United States, um, and it's in Massachusetts. And if you see this picture, you'll see this little arm coming out. 
And you'll see Truro, that's the town she moves to. It's way up on the arm, and Provincetown is at the very end, kind of the area the pilgrims came over from England and landed. So um, very historic area, very beautiful, very barren parts of it, um, very cold in the winter, uh, full of tourists in the summer. It's, 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 it is a stunning place. There's another picture of it showing an old map of that. Um, and so when you go live there, you, you know, you're far away from a lot of stuff. So it's kind of an isolating location, but, but extremely, extremely beautiful. And I guess she just, she had enough money to be able to afford to go hang out and maybe, you know, work from a distance. So she did that. And, um, she bought herself, she went to Truro and that's the town she moved to. Let me find her uh, Truro. Here we go. All right. So she moved to Truro. And she got this house. Uh, it was actually, a, I think it's actually a family house, a grandmother's or something. And it's very isolated. And you can see it's got a long driveway that goes up there. And this is important because when you're looking at suspects as to who would do what, you're looking at, for example, who would be near that house. Um, there's, there's cases where I've worked on where you say, okay, there were a lot of better houses to choose from. You know, maybe a house that was more isolated or a house that was right up front, but this person bypassed all the good houses and went to the location that you wonder why. And then you have to be suspicious of who that person is as to why they would pick that particular spot. So who had access, who would come by this house, who would know where her house was. So this becomes an issue in her case. So um, it turns out she was stabbed to death at her home in Truro, Massachusetts. Her body was found January 6, 2002, with her daughter clinging to it. The child was unharmed. It was a two-year-old daughter, Ava. She, she did have a baby. And let me, let me show you this. Um, she, she did achieve having a child, and she loved this child. And she was happy she had this child. And so there she was finally with the child that she wanted. Uh, I don't know how happy she was in her general life, but she had the child and she adored the child. And it was a kind of a horrific crime scene because inside the house, um, if you see this here, um, it was very sad because the child was clinging to her for like a couple of days and trying to wake her mommy up. So she had gone into the bathroom and see that uh, the, the blood on the... the, the um, washcloth there she apparently tried to put some wet cloth on her mommy's head to wake her up she tried to feed her to a little bit of something in her mouth and that's where you see the the blood on the what looks like an eyedropper and it's it's pretty 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 damn sad so uh horrific crime um now the question comes down to who did this to her all right so the police start with the people she knows so let's go to the people she knows all right let me let me find my boyfriend section. <laughs> so you know she she had to go through a few boyfriends to find a boyfriend that you know th she was hoping would work out for her. Um, uh, this fellow over here is a magician in New York, and, and and the reason I put him up here is simply because in the desperation to find out who killed her, the police supposedly showed up and and said to him, "Did you do it? And you know how, you got away with it so well? It's like a magician did it." <laughs> He's like. What? We haven't even been together for a long time. What are you even talking about? So, not not him, not him. Okay, so then we come down to these two guys. Okay, let me let me tell you who these two guys are. Um, these are her boyfriends on Cape Cod. All right, so let me get their names here. All right, so guy number one was her first boyfriend. I think it was her first boyfriend there. Hold on a second. Where's my... Where's my thing gone to? What? Hold on a second. Are they? Are they kidding me? Oh, they did not do that to me. You know, what happens sometimes? You go to, you go to an article, and you're reading the article, and and half and you go back to the article to read it again, and they say, "Oh, you haven't subscribed, so therefore you can't see the rest of the article." That's what they're doing to me now. I can't believe it. I just read this article, and now they're telling me I can't access it. <laughs> okay, hold on a second. Now I have now I have to go back. Ah, um, oh, this is really annoying. Okay, okay, wait a minute. I found. Okay, Tim Arnold. Okay, 
Tim Arnold dated, dated Krista Worthington for about a year before the relationship ended. He remained in touch with Worthington, however. At the time of the murder, Arnold's father lived on a property that was near the Worthington house. Arnold discovered the crime scene when he returned to Washington's house with a borrowed flashlight. Okay, now let me show you this, um, where he actually lived. Here he is. Okay, this is Tim Arnold. And, and do you see? You see over here, that's his house, and that's her house. Now, he was obviously suspicious because A, he's a jilted lover, B, he lived really close by, and C, he supposedly says his daddy told him to return a flashlight on Sunday evening. Some was somebody Sunday afternoon. I, it was like four, five o'clock, so it was dark. So he goes over to her house, and then there's he makes he ends up seeing that something's wrong. Peeps in and sees that she's dead. So he calls nine one one. Nine one one. What is your emergency? Please send somebody to Fifty Depot Road. It's Krista Worthington. I don't know what happened. I think she fell down or something. I'm just, I'm a friend. And I just was returning a flashlight to her. Okay, now I'm going to be sure I put your comments up here as we go on. What? It? <laughs> Tim Arnold, yes. Did I not say Tim Arnold? I hope I said Tim Arnold and not Tom Arnold or Tim Allen. <laughs> But Benny, are you trying to confuse me, or am I trying to confuse everybody? Yes. Um, uh, Steve says, uh, I watched Murder on the Cape, but maybe it's more fiction than fact. Possibly. We'll see. All right. So uh, so let's go to Tim here. Um, and please don't bring up anything. If you know what, what, what the final conclusion is, please don't talk about it right now, because I want to point out the issues. Okay, so, so Tim... Yeah, Tim Arnold. Now, now you got me confused, Joe. Um, oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So now you're pointing out something that just bothers me. Just, just. And that word just again. Eh? Guilty. Okay. I've never liked the word just because usually it means there's a lie involved somehow. And he says, I just got here. You know, I just, I'm just a friend. Da, 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 da. He's not telling the truth. He's not just a friend. He's a jilted lover. So that that's covered... Maybe he doesn't want to admit he's a jilted lover, but he's, you know, he's saying just a friend. And I just came here, and Daddy told me to bring a flashlight. Did Daddy tell him to bring a flashlight? Why would you go at 5 o'clock in the afternoon to bring a flashlight? It's really questionable. So is he a good suspect? Yes, an extremely good suspect because possible motive. Look, you know, he certainly had, uh, he, was, he did not have an alibi as far as I know, and could have done it. So he's a very good suspect. All right, so now let's look at the next suspect. And that would be the man she had the baby with. All right, well, let's find the man she had a baby with. Okay, here he is. Now, this guy is, oh, let me see if I can find the information on him here. Okay, his name is Tony Jacket. And he was kind of hot looking in his young days. Got a bit. Hmm. Kind of hot. All right. So anyway, there he is with Ava, the daughter. And there he is with his wife. Yes, now you see the problem if you don't know the case. Wife. Not ex-wife. Wife. And a number of children. Like, I think six of them. Anyway. All right. Tony Jacket, who fathered Krista Worthington's child, Ava, during a brief affair. Apparently, he was just taken by her. She was, she just, you know. Been married for many years, got that little itch. Here comes the available lady who looks kind of cute, and she's all, you know, she's from New York, and she's kind of well-known, and so they do it, and she gets pregnant. It says here, he was a, he is currently the Truro Harbor Master and Shellfish Constable. All right, so um, he, uh, he said, I was never ever called, I was never told there was a suspect. But he did say that they had told him he was a person of interest. Okay, so the problem here came down to that supposedly Krista and he made a deal that she was just going to raise the kid on her own, and he was out of the picture. At some point along the way, before her murder, apparently she changed her mind and wanted him to be involved. And she was even writing a letter, and this question I couldn't quite figure out, she sent the letter to the wife, basically saying, 
I'm ha I had an affair with your, your husband. Anyway, the wife did find out that she had an affair with her husband, and this was that the husband's kid. So not only did, uh, did um, Tony Jacket become a suspect, but the wife became a suspect too, like, hey, you know, I gotta get this woman out of my life. Um, or maybe together they decide to get rid of her and just take the kid and put everything behind them, you know. So he was another good suspect. So time goes on and they did find out that she had semen inside her. Uh, she had been stabbed brutally. She had been beaten. She had been stabbed even a knife straight through the chest. Um, and if you go back and look at the, this particular picture, uh, where'd I put it? Where'd I put it? Okay, wait a minute. Hold on. Oh, here. I didn't show it yet. That's why. Okay. Here she is on the floor. She is clothed from the top up. Um, and it looks like it could be a sexual assault. There is semen inside her and on her. Um, and she's stabbed with this knife that came from her own kitchen. Um, and also, if you notice again here, there, this is when, this is the day that this is when her body was found. There's some drag marks down here and there's also a, a smashed in door. So those are all very interesting points. Uh, the question came down to whether somebody had actually raped and murdered her in a sexual homicide. All right. So they had DNA. And they did a dragnet, which was very unusual, and uh, a lot of people think it shouldn't, that kind of thing shouldn't happen. But they don't force you to give your DNA. They just say, are you willing to give your DNA? And if you say no, then they're like, hmm, why is that? <laughs> so it's kind of like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. But if you're innocent and you're willing to give your DNA, well, then you can get cleared. But if you don't like the concept of it, you're going to be looked at as possibly a good person of interest, you know or a total suspect. So anyway, they did this whole thing. And so time went on um, and people were always, were wondering, oh, here's this, here's suspect number. Oh, there's another suspect. I forgot about this suspect. So now we're down to basically these suspects. We've got the jilted boyfriend, daddy, of da baby daddy. And then this, her, her own father started hanging out with this person who looks to be in really bad shape, in my opinion, is way younger than him, like by 40 years. And there's concern whether maybe this thing, I'm sorry, this woman, she just looks like hell, sorry. <laughs> that wasn't nice of me. <laughs> this, this woman wanted Chris out of the way so she could collect all his money. I, you know, that was another theory. And so these, these were the suspects. It just hung on and hung on and hung on. All right, so then what exactly happened? So after the DNA thing came in, then this happened. This guy, Christopher McGowan, gets arrested and charged with the murder of Krista Worthington. And of course, everybody's kind of like, who? <laughs> you know, who? Who's this? Who's this guy? You know, well, this guy is a. Let me let me pull him up. All right. So so his name is Christopher McGowan. All right. All right, Christopher, where'd you go? Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Christopher McGowan. Okay, no, that's the wrong guy. It's another Christopher. Where's Christopher McGowan gone to? Okay, here he is. All right. In November 2006, Christopher McGowan was convicted of the murder of Krista Worthington. So he not only was arrested, he was convicted. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And by the way, there's a really there's a videos of him, and when he's, you know, he's like crying in the court, his tears rolling down his cheeks. He's like, I didn't do it, you know. Uh, and currently incarcerated at the Old Colony Correctional Center in Bridgewater, he has consistently professed his innocence over the years through various motions. Although, sorry, although various motions and appeals about the verdict have been denied, McGowan. McCowan, sorry, it's not McGowan. McCowan was interviewed from prison in a 2017 ABC television program, and that's the one I just showed you. I didn't have nothing to do with it, he said, on the show. Okay, so just to point out again, after he was, um, after, after he was arrested, these, the show, let me show you the actual, what the show says. If you look here, Killing on the Cape. Uh, accomplished fashion writer found stabbed to death at her home. 
Police ask men in Truro, Massachusetts for DNA samples in murder investigation. Suspected killer Chris McCowan shares his side of the Krista Worthington case. This is the crux of why you make a, why you make a documentary, because now you can add that element of, oh, you know, maybe he's innocent. Otherwise, it's kind of boring. So, oh, maybe he's innocent. And actually, the book that was written by um, this fellow, um, the, where'd it go? Oh, there it is. Okay, he's on the show, too. His name is Peter Manso, and his book is called The Reasonable Doubt. Now, so books, the fashion writer Cape Cod and the trial of Chris McCowan. Now, here is the, when he was, McCowan indicted on murder and rape charges. Okay, so this goes to court, and what they will show in court, what they will show in court uh, in this movie is how it's very possible that he was railroaded. All right, obviously, you know, of all the people, there were so many good suspects, you know what I mean? There really were, and, and if you believe he's innocent, really are. Okay, now let's take a look at him. Did he do it or didn't he? Because, you know, if he did, he's just an unlucky son of a gun. I mean, I'm sorry, if he's innocent, he's an unlucky son of a gun whose DNA happened to show up at the crime scene. Uh, and if he didn't do, if he did do it, well, he did it. <laughs> so anyway, how did this happen? All right. So when they arrest him, he said, when they first talk to this guy, he says, I don't know, I, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a trash collector on her route. I never met her. I didn't talk to her, blah, blah, blah. And then when they brought him back in, they go, yeah, but you know, we have your DNA in her and on her. And he's like, oh, okay. So now you want to hear what his explanation is of this. Okay. This is his explanation he gave to the police after they told him his DNA was there. I can move this over carefully. I don't want to. Okay. Being a garbage man. I get to go by everybody's houses and, you know, get to talk to them briefly. Now, um, I talk to my Amazon guys a lot because they come up and they, the dogs run out and try to eat them. So <laughs> and, but, you know, not my dogs, my daughter's dogs. And, and I try to save them from, and some of the guys actually like the dogs. They jump out and pet them. And so I talk, I know my, a lot of my Amazon guys by name because we order a whole lot of crap. Um, our, our trash guys, not so much. Because usually they're down by the trash cans. You know, see what I'm saying? Uh, they're not next to the house. They're wherever you put your trash. And our, ours is at the end of our driveway. And so when I hear the trash man out there, I don't run down to say, hi, how's it going to today? I mean, I can't say that I ever have talked to the trash guy. Not because I don't want to. It's just I don't have any, I'm just not down there. And he seems to claim that he talks to lots of people briefly. But then he said, now, remember, Worthington was found dead on Sunday, but that previous Thursday, McCowan said he was coming by her house for a trash pickup, and she asked him about getting rid of her Christmas tree. Well, that's plausible. She asked me to come into the house and to look at her Christmas tree, he said. After she invited him in, McCowan said one thing led to another. It was just like it was a mutual thing between two people, I guess. We started kissing. Then we ended up having sex. Okay, apparently in the middle of the day, she decides to have sex with a guy she doesn't know on, apparently on the floor of the, he says on the floor, with her two-year-old running around. Ah, uh, you know, I'm having a bit of a problem with this. Could it have happened? The problem is, yes, it could have happened. And this is what the defense attorney is trying to say. Well, of course it could have happened. I mean, she didn't have a boyfriend at that time. She was hot to try. You know, she wanted a little sex. And he's not a bad looking dude. You know what I mean? He's quite, he thinks himself the ladies man. So maybe he came in and he smiled at her and she thought, mm, I could use some of that. So they, they started chatting and then he, he made a little move and she kissed him. And then they just ended up ripping all their clothes off and having sex on the floor. Could it have happened? Yes, it could have. And there were claims, um, the, the defense attorney tried to claim later that the, the, jury, uh, the jury was prejudiced against Chris McCowan because he was black and a garbage man. And that they be didn't believe that a white woman would have sex with a lower class black man. Really? Okay. So there's an assumption that white people think this way. 
And I'm going to guess if I were on that jury, somebody would say the same thing about me. Oh, that, that, that old white lady. You know, she probably thinks that a white woman wouldn't have sex with the, the black trash man. You know, considering I was married to a black man for 25 years, and when I married him, he was a mail clerk in the basement of National Geographic Building in D.C. <laughs> and he, I came from a wealthy family. He came from an immigrant family. And I was college educated, and he wasn't. I'm going to say, yes, some white women will have sex with black men. <laughs> and if you thought on the jury that I'd be one of those that wouldn't see, you made a presumption there. Or you're just trying to pull in a racial thing, which doesn't need to be there. And the, the jury said, that is not true. That is, we didn't think that she couldn't have had sex with this man. That, you know, that's not the issue. So here, let's go on with the story about him. So McCowan said they just he had sex with Worthington just that one time. Wasn't that coinky dink? You know what I mean? You know, just b bad luck, dude. You know, it's like, you know, you couldn't have had sex with her two months ago. No, you had to have sex with her right before she gets murdered. Yeah, uh, her body was found three days later, but he insists he didn't kill her. The prosecution maintains to this day that the evidence against McCowan and him alone was overwhelming. All right, so there's no question that he had sex with her. He admits he had sex with her and his DNA is there. Okay, the problem was during the trial, they, okay, they present forensic evidence to show the match, there's no question. And uh, as well as statements McCowan made during a six hour interview with two investigators after his arrest. Now, interestingly, people ask, well, why wasn't it recorded? According to Massachusetts law, a person can ask for it not to be recorded. They wanted to record it. The police detectives wanted to record it. He refused. Now, that's a smart move, in my opinion, in some ways, because no matter what, he can say, I never said that. And that's exactly what the defense is saying. Oh, those, those, those detectives railroaded him. They fed him information. He never said these things. And along with that, now he supposedly has low IQ and blah, blah, blah. All right. Um, but they said that uh, McCowan made, um, ch kept changing his story from saying he never knew Worthington to saying he went over to her house and had sex with her. So what'll do, what, what a, a way a possible psychopath will do and a, and a guilty person is they will only tell you as much as they think you know. So in the beginning, he's going to say, I never talked to her. I, just, I was just on her route. As soon as he finds out his DNA is there, he's like, oh, well, but okay. I did have sex with her because he can't get out of it, but it was consensual. So he keeps doing, saying these things. Then he says that not third after third, supposedly he, uh, it was Thursday afternoon or whatever that he had sex with her. And then fr late Friday night or Saturday morning, now he claims that he went over, see this dude over here? Supposedly they were partying together. And then after they left the party, they went over to her house and she wanted to have sex with him, but this guy wanted to rob her, and then it turned into this big, huge fight, and that he beat her up, um, you know, and he's, in a, he's the one that ended up pulling the knife and killing her. You see, he just had sex with her, because she, let's, let me see what he said on that. Oh, I actually, I had to put this down, because I thought it was kind of funny. Um, this is actually what he said. <laughs> now he's changed things. Okay, he first says Chris asked him to dispose of a Christmas tree on Friday night. What happened to Thursday? Now it's Friday. Then he admitted to having sex with her on the living room floor. Oh, I, I take that back. Actually, he says, I fucked her on the living room floor. This guy has a problem being polite about women. Maybe a complete disrespect for women. So then he says this. Then he, he says he and Jeremy Frazier uh, said they, they were together. And then he asked Frazier to drive him to Christus to have sex because, you know, <laughs> this is a woman on his route and he just knows she wants to have sex with him. So he says, hey, can you take me over? It's like midnight, but hey, I want, she wants to have sex with me. I know it. So they drove over there and <laughs> Krista was startled to see them. <laughs> yeah, <I> think. <laughs> so she probably comes out of the house and goes, what the hell? Why, why are these guys outside my house? But he said he was tipsy and told her she was, uh, he just wanted some pussy. <laughs> oh, God, I just can't make this stuff up. And she was cool with it. Because, you know, 
even though there are two dudes there, and, you know, I mean, she hadn't had some for a while, so, hey, sure, come on in and have some. So then he had sex with her, and, <laughs> and Frazier started stealing stuff, and Krista caught him. That's when, see, this is where it all went bad. It wasn't that he showed up in the middle of the night wanting, wanting a little something-something, <laughs> and she was willing to give it, but that this dude had the gall to steal crap from her house. Now, if, the one of the funny things about the house is that she is such a slob. I mean, she was, she was an incredible, incredible slob. There's, tr like, crap everywhere in that house. It's a mess. It's an absolute disaster. I don't think he could have found things that were worth taking in that, uh, under those conditions. Um, so, that, like, what, he's just bored, like, you're getting sex, and I, where, where, where is he while they're having sex? I mean, he's just, like, they're, like, having sex on the floor, and what's he doing? Like, just wandering about around the room? <clears throat> anyway... So Krista caught him. They left, and Krista followed them. Of course, you know, he doesn't say, this guy doesn't say he actually took anything, right? So what's Krista mad about? Her phone is in the kitchen. Apparently she even tried to dial, looked like she was trying to dial 911, and she only got to the 9 before some worse happened. But they left, and Krista followed them out, screaming at Fraser and Jer, fr screaming at him. He lost it, and I did too in the driveway. You just had sex with a woman, and your friend is stealing crap from her, so you're mad at her? Okay. Then Jeremy dragged her in the house because of her drag, those drag marks. Let me see if I can go back to our thing where the, um, uh, supposedly, yeah, there were these, whoops, that's not it. Okay, where is it? Here we go. Okay. Supposedly, there are these drag marks into the house. <clears throat> and now, and then, but here's the interesting thing is I don't know why the door's busted down because the door's busted down right and it was Frazier who beat her and grabbed the knife from the kitchen and stabbed her okay so it seems to me more like there was a tussle outside and she broke free ran into the house tried to lock it and somebody somebody kicked the door in but the problem that the, the prosecutors finally came up with was like hey there's no there's no there's no proof that uh this, this this dude was even anywhere near that house. So likely he was actually, the, the story he's telling is probably actually fairly true, except he wasn't there. He just brings along his friend to be the one to kill her. And that gives him also an excuse why he can have consensual sex on the floor while his friend is watching. They're freaky people, you know? Okay, so... <laughs> Now the defense claims he never touched the knife and that the police manipulated him in the statements because it wasn't recorded. All right. So now they also claim he was childlike, he had a low IQ, and he just was saying whatever they wanted to please them. Then he claims also he had sex with a number of women on the route. This dude's so hot that all the women can't resist him. Now, <laughs> oh, Lord God. All right, so by the way, just so you know, this guy's supposed to be like the most wonderful guy ever, right? Um, apparently, he was actually had a criminal record of, uh, let's see, where's his criminal record? Uh, burglary? Eh, burglary. He's, got a, he's got a criminal record and, but here's the interesting, he has five outstanding um, uh, no contact from five women. Because five women are scared as crap of him. He apparently made, had three babies by three different women. Uh, but uh, he's got these, uh, these orders against him uh, to stay away from these women, five different women. So he's not Mr. Peaceful. So all that's bull. Now, let's look at one more piece of evidence that the defense claims is so. All right. And then I'll, and then I'll look at your comments and we'll talk a little bit. And then we'll go on to Linda Silva case, the other case. Um, so... Wait a minute, where is it? Okay, so now one of the things the writer in his book puts points out, and, and he says that it, it's his, the experts testified there was no physical evidence of rape and that tailless sperm collected from the victim's vagina indicated that intercourse, consensual or not, had occurred as early as Thursday afternoon, almost two days before. Okay almost two days before now this is a defense trick they try to extend the possibility 
that this is proof that it could have happened two days earlier on Thursday. Okay, now, I researched tailless sperm. Uh, the longest time recorded for tailless sperm, uh, for, for sperms with tails, is a, the record is 26 hours. 26 hours. After 26 hours, they're finding sperms with no tails. Okay, there, this is one of the studies. There's another study that says somewhat 24 to 26. It's, it's in that range. Yes, if he had sex with her on Thursday, there might be tailless sperms by the time her body was discovered. But let's move, let's move forward to Friday night. Let's even move forward to Saturday morning. Let's say Saturday morning at 1 a.m. She was found Sunday afternoon. That's already 24 hours plus another five hours. We're up to 29 hours. And they didn't, they didn't take a look at the sperm on the scene. You know what I mean? So they had to then move her body. So we're talking about 20, wait, a minute, wait a minute, I'm working here. 28 hours for 30, 30, 31, 32 hours, whatever, before they even began to do that stuff. The record was 26. So even if she was killed and even if she was raped on Saturday morning at 1 a.m., the tails would still probably not be there. So this is a defense trick, trying to pull it out, trying to confuse the defense, the, the jury, because the jury doesn't know crap about uh, how sperm lives and dies, how many have tails and how many don't, what research has been done. I mean, I had to look it up. I didn't know. I had to say, okay. And I went and looked at about five or six different studies. So the, the jury can't know this crap. So that this is so the defense throws at them. He's got a low IQ, which there's no proof of, um, that, that he's a peaceful guy, which is not true, uh, that, he, that he, it was consensual sex, which is not proven, that his stories were forced, which is not proven, that his, the sperm... Could have been there since Thursday, which is true, but also true that it could have happened on Saturday morning at 1 a.m. So this is what the defense does. They throw the, everything in the kitchen sink at the jury to confuse them, to try to get them off. Didn't work. Um, so uh, that, so it's just very interesting that apparently in this particular case, there is pretty damn good evidence that this guy's guilty. Um, I, you know, between the did, I, between the fact that he did have sex with her, and his DNA was there, the likelihood of her actually having sex spontaneously with the garbage guy just because he comes to pick up a Christmas tree while her daughter's running around the house is pretty limited, possible but limited. But then he tells a story about how it all went down and it matches the crime scene evidence, but he tries to blame it on somebody else. So he lies, he lies, he lies, and then he creates stuff to try to excuse himself. That's a sign of a guilty person. So much as the original guy with a flashlight said, just and just, and you wonder why he had to return a flashlight. You know, this guy comes up as the guy who did it. And, and it's more likely that the, 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 the jilted lover that he would have done what he did to her, even though they were in a fairly decent relationship, is unlikely. Even, even the father of the baby that he would go over and do that, and leave, his, leave, his, leave his little baby running around. You know, the first thing that the jilted lover did <laughs> when he came in and he saw the baby on the ground, the first thing he did was grab up the baby and take the baby out to the car and hand the baby to his father. So he cared about the child. I don't think he's, he wouldn't have killed the child, killed her and then left the child to starve to death for two days and maybe, maybe even, you know, have no water, whatever happened to that child. So you saw caring from him. So, you know, the fact that child was left, you know, the left on her own for so long makes me question that, that, that either of the men who were in her life did it. But he would, could care less probably. I probably knew the kid couldn't, identify him if the kid was even you know not sleeping in bed she, child was probably sleeping in bed at that time and got up and found her mommy on the floor so he was able to just simply rape and murder her while the child was sleeping and and that was that um but uh that the two that the two men would have that cared about her and ava would have let, let would have left ava uh to just starve to death for days it's probably unlikely and they didn't show that kind of behavior so um let me see. Uh, what? I, I have no idea what that is. Uh, I, I'm going to be very careful about any. I, I try not to go to anything that's just a bunch of gossip crap. Okay? 
just a bunch of gossip crap. Okay, it doesn't matter. I don't even. I don't care whether Krista, what Krista did in her her life. I don't. Uh, there's a lot of you know commentary about her that she was pretty aggressive and that she, you know, she pushed these guys, uh, you know, pushed these guys away. She used them. She might have. She might have, but it has nothing to do with this guy killing her. I mean, it really doesn't. It does make a different difference to the detectives. Now, if you're actually, in, you know, investigating this case, I get where the detectives are going to look at her boyfriends. You know, usually those are the people who do you in as a boyfriend. So that they would look at them makes sense. But you know, a lot of other crap is just, you know, it's 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 at this point, it doesn't sound like it's. Um, <laughs> this guy has all the hookup lines. Yeah, but he obviously he does, but he also doesn't respect women because, you know, the woman's dead and you're going to say the F word and then the, the, you know, pussy word. I mean, really, this is what you would say. You would more likely say, if you were a decent kind of human being, you would say, you know, I went over there, you know, original story, one thing led to another. But to actually just be crude about a dead woman it shows you have to total lack of respect. Um, what is it? Hello, I'm glad you're here. I'm late and about to part the person about guys having sex with a, with a garbage man. Ah, a woman I know had sex with a guy who delivered a washing machine and her four-year-old daughter was home at the time. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, I, I don't disagree that it can happen. I think it's fairly unlikely, but yes, it can happen. So that's why you can't take that away. The problem was his stories. Now, admittedly, you could say, he didn't, he didn't want to put, you know, when they said, hey, did you, do you know this lady? He's like, oh, crap, you know, I had sex with her, and then now I'm being, you know, I don't want to get accused of killing her. I get that. Um, so, yeah, I can see where he went there first. My problem is, is when his story came down to the big changes he started making to explain away uh, what happened and started bringing his buddy into it and actually explaining the, how the whole crime went down. There's where I said, I'm going to say that guy is likely guilty. <laughs> No, because if you didn't do it, you would have no other story. You have no other story. This is, you know, when I did the Amanda Knox case, and if you want to go and take a look at that, if you haven't, um, one of the big issues I had with Amanda Knox was not that I believe she actually murdered her supposed friend uh, in, in, in Italy. It was that she put herself at the crime scene and then blamed her boss for the murder. That's incredibly weird. So if you just weren't there, you just weren't there. You're just like, I'm at my boyfriend's house. <laughs> Got no more to say. You know, I don't know what else you're going to, what else am I going to say? I was at my boyfriend's house. But, you know, when you are actually there and you're trying to explain away whatever involvement you have, then you start saying things and trying to blame other people for things, maybe to push stuff away from the person you don't want them to look at for whatever reasons. He wants to blame him. He wants to take his own friend down. He accused his own friend of murder. You know, and, and his story, the the actual oh, things are fuzzing out here. The actual um, the actual crime that he's describing makes sense, except without him there. That's what happened with Amanda Knox too. She explained certain things that tell me she was there. She wasn't in the room when the girl's being murdered, but that tells me she was there. His story tells me he was there. He wasn't, but he was there. And he's actually describing what he did and not what he did. So, you know, I think that they found the right guy eventually, and he did indeed commit the crime. And, you know, if he hadn't given that second story, I might have said, you know, hey, he just didn't want to admit to having sex with her. And she maybe she was just into having a midday fling. <laughs> so um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember that. There was, oh, there was definitely... Um, yeah, she had a lot of she had a lot of wounds on her body. Believe me, she was brutally, brutally murdered. Brutally, there was no question. There's no question she was brutally murdered by whomever. But his story still still sticks. Um, I uh, this question, yes, it was her primary residence at that point in time. That's where she was raising her daughter. Uh, how many Molly says? How many convicted murderers or rapists eventually admit their guilt? Seems like zero. Oh no, serial killers are happy to admit their guilt once they're in prison for life or on death row, and there's a massive amount of evidence. Then they then they want journalists to come and write books about them, and they'll admit not only to their own crimes but to everybody else's as well, so they can get the numbers up. <laughs> um, Doreen says his story makes him look guilty. Yes, it does. 
He should have said he had sex with her and kept his mouth shut after that. Right. And, and quite frankly, there would be no place to go after that if that's all he ever did. That's my point about Amanda Knox, too. There's no place to go. If you had sex with her on Thursday and weren't even near her house again, where do you come up with another story that actually matches all the evidence? Um, Amanda Knox. All she had to do was say, I stayed at my boyfriend's house. How come she's suddenly cowering in the kitchen listening to her Meredith screaming? You know, there's no reason for that story to come out any place. Because you, if you're not there, you're not there. So, yeah. Um, well, we don't know. Steve, it's possible. I don't know if she's that type. Um, oh, we're talking about drugs. Yeah, you know, it doesn't matter. The dr nothing about drugs makes any difference in this case. Okay? Um, it doesn't. Uh, yes, it, they, di they did try to claim she was promiscuous. But, that, again, drugs, promiscuity, yes, they can make you a high-risk victim. Um, let's even say, theoretically, theoretically, okay, let's say they did have sex on Thursday because she thought he was pretty hot. So they had sex on the, on the floor, like he claims. But he comes back a couple days later and decides he wants a little more something something after the party and he's a little you know high she, he's, she's like I, no that was a one time thing dude go away and he gets pissed and he's like huh, you know oh one time that's all I'm worth one time and he gets mad and he, he breaks in the door and kills her and doesn't have sex with her hmm that's an interesting possibility again could have happened that way. So the sex could have happened on Thursday, but the, kill, the, the, the homicide actually happened on Saturday, early Saturday morning at 1 a.m. That could have happened because, and that could have made him mad that she wouldn't do it with him again. Because he dis, he's totally disrespectful of women, there's no question, and he's violent toward women. He wouldn't have five restraining orders on him, you know? So that could have also happened. Regardless, that story, that the, the, the story he actually told about how it went down actually works for him, ignoring that dude. So, so that could have been. It could have been true that he had sex one time and didn't get it the second time. So that's a story of Krista Worthington and um, Chris. I think Chris McGowan is guilty. I think they got the right guy. Um, and I feel sorry for all the other guys who people still, still suspect, you know, because they were involved in her life but this is how confusing it can get and even when you come down to did he do it you see even a lot of you say well he could have she could have had sex with him on thursday yeah and maybe it was the only time they did have sex maybe he came back and killed her later because she wouldn't the second time see how complicated this gets especially when you've got other suspects and and and, it, and there were other suspects. The real question comes down to is, is, is he a serial killer? Um, or is, was it a, a case of he got angry because she wouldn't put out the second time? Don't know. Don't know. But I'm going to say they got the right guy. Now, we have an, inter, this interesting case. And I, the reason I put these two together was, yes, they're both on Cape Cod. <laughs> so this is the case of Linda Silva. And let me pull up the basics. Oh, I'm going to come over here to my own stuff. Almost, you can almost find nothing about Linda Silva and the murder of Linda Silva uh, on the net. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read this one to you because it's actually, this was written because I came to Cape Cod to work on this case with Linda. Um, and this is, by the way, Linda and her brother. Uh, I think that's Mike. Is that Mike? I think it's Mike. Um, I worked this case in... 2000 so 20 years ago uh, and I had to really tr I had to work hard to find any of my evidence on this any of my paperwork on this case and, and and I found some on my old hard drive and as you can see here this is the Linda Silva file so from my paperwork file from from that from that time um, now and it says here it's been over four years and the murder of social worker Linda Silva remains unsolved Police are still investigating, but it seems a long time since anything new turned up. And now, Pat Brown has showed up. Silva was killed on September 12th, 1996, by a single gunshot to the head as she prepared to get in her car. Um, her car was parked on Alden Street, where it meets Bradford. 
It was around 7.30 p.m., raining lightly, and she had just come from having a drink at the Governor Bradford just down the street. Although several people reported hearing a pop, no one saw anything. Maybe they did. But um, here is, um, this is in Cape Cod. Uh, again, this is, this is Provincetown. Um, this is at the very end of that, that arm thing I talked about before. Uh, down, see, see, Provincetown is way, way, way over there on the left. It's, um, oops, it's, it's right there at the very, very end. It's a cute little, very touristy town in the summer, extremely touristy in the summer. And the, the, so this is what it looks like in the summer, not in the winter. Um, so she was shot in September, so in between seasons, a little chilly. She was at the Governor Bradford, that's up there, um, and she was at the bar having a drink. She walks out, she goes around the corner, poof, she gets shot by her car. Now, Silva's body was discovered shortly afterward and the police were called. Although thousands of hours of investigation ensued, no arrests were made and no suspect identified. And now, Pat Brown and my work was bringing the case back to the forefront by posting, uh, I posted on my site about this and then I went up there. Okay, I came up there to, to Cape Cod and she was able to locate the lobster man the police had formerly wanted to test there was this guy that they believed had maybe been involved in killing her um he he's a local guy he was involved in drugs um and he was around like right around the governor bradford at the time and they wanted to talk to him and they couldn't find him and they couldn't get him to polygraph so at any rate um i was able to find him I brought. I, I was able to locate him. It wasn't that difficult. Uh, I tracked him down. I talked to him. I said, "Hey, dude, you know, the police really they they focused on you. You know, um, I'm gonna. I know you don't trust the police, and you don't trust their 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 polygrapher. You think that they're gonna bring in some dude, and they're gonna sit there, and they're gonna they're gonna make you confess to something you didn't do. I tell you what, I don't have a. Uh, you know, I'm I'm from outside. You know, I'm from Washington D.C. So I'm going to get a. I will bring in a a, a polygrapher that has nothing to do with the police. Completely separate guy, paid for out of my money. Um, I'll bring him in and I'll make sure that the, the test is done properly, that the questions asked are proper questions. And now I want you to understand what proper questions are. Do you have any guilt in the murder, the murder of Linda Silva? Don't, that's a terrible question. Well, maybe you have guilt. Maybe you think that, well, you know, I was dealing drugs with the people that might've done her in or Maybe I should have not. Uh, maybe I should have warned her about something. Then you feel guilt. That's not a good question. So I said I'm going to make sure the questions asked are specific, proper questions you can answer yes or no without having any issues over. What does she mean by that? Maybe I do. Maybe I do. you know, none of that stuff. Anyway, he uh, says that Brown, the the lobster man, passed the polygraph. He did. However, there was still the possibility that he had some knowledge of the crime. But he and he may have even seen the crime, but he didn't commit the crime. All right. On the other hand, she said, two members of the Silva family who did not have alibis for the night of the murder did not show up for their appointments and refused to reschedule. This is absolutely true. Now, um, I'm going to read to you. Let's see, let's sit in here. Let's see where I'm at. Right. Okay. Um, well, maybe I put it up here. Um, this is one of the, okay, uh, let's see if there's any more I want to hear at. So then we go to, let me see if I can find it here. Hold on a second. <laughs> All right. I was written this, uh, where did it go? The brother called me. This was um, one of the, I actually interviewed the fa each one of the family members and her ex-boyfriends. I had, I, I sat in this one place with great Italian food, thank God. And I had these dinner after dinner after dinner with these, with these fellas um, who were possible suspects because, you know, she had, she had some boyfriends and um, some squirrely boyfriends. And uh, this is her brother, Alfred. 
Alfred called me this afternoon on my cell phone asking about the polygraph. He said he thought it was ridiculous, and he asked me why I hadn't gone after the Springfield guys. The Springfield guys are drug dealers. And what about so-and-so and so-and-so, drug dealers? Uh, uh, theoretically connected to the Boston mob. Now, I don't want to get into the you know, heavy details of this because it serves no point at this point. However, there, there's a joke that went around where... Um, they were basically saying uh, this location was a nice little uh, drinking village with a fishing problem. <laughs> a nice little drinking village with a fishing problem. So what happened uh, to Provincetown at this time was that the lobsters were going downhill and people weren't able to make as much money. So drugs were now being the thing they were bringing into the area. So, you know, they take their boats out and pick up drugs and bring them in. So there was a pretty big, pretty big drug trade at the time of cocaine um, because people weren't making money from lobstering. So anyway, so he asked me, so what about these people and these people? And what about this other guy who's supposedly an informant? I told him I wasn't going to waste money chasing people all over the damn state when the local folks were without alibis and won't clear themselves. So he asked if he had to take the polygraph and I said, in my opinion, yes. He said he was innocent. As far as he was concerned, he was eliminated. <laughs> well, I guess you would say that. Then he hemmed and hawed about the polygraph and told me he'd have to think about it. I said, fine, call me back. End of conversation. He wouldn't take it. Um, so, now, when this occurred, I was brought in by the family. Now, the family was split into two sections. Um, and one, one section was the brothers and, and the parents, and the other section was uh, was a sister and her husband. They were the ones who brought me in. And they had concerns that she was killed by somebody in that was to do with drugs. And the belief was, and this was a story at the time, was just that this fellow had taken some money, like $10,000 worth of cocaine or whatever, and it was owed. At that time, Linda went to her parents and asked her parents to give her $10,000, supposedly for a new car, and they refused. But the question always was, was that for the car or was that to help her brother out? Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is that there were a lot of people here who were connected to the mob. The guy that was polygraphed, his brother. Um, I, I, got, I got tons of names here of people um, who were supposedly connected to this whole, this whole drug issue. Now, um, let me see where there there here was a here was one scenario I came up with during at the time. Interesting enough, the police refused to ever ever interview anybody in the family. It's like they were afraid to, um, which was really peculiar. Um, in the weeks prior to the death of Linda Silva, something was amiss. Miss Silva was behaving oddly, acting skittish, and somewhat depressed. And, and one of the things you always look at is what happened right prior to the murder that would have inspired a murder. Okay. She told people she thought someone had been in her house. Meanwhile, there were some issues about vehicles being brought in and out that were theoretically part of the uh, being brought into family businesses. Uh, that was the Springfield mob running drugs from Provincetown back upstate. During this period, cocaine worth ten thousand dollars was rumored to have been stolen from one of the drug runners' homes. Brother, what brother was suspected to be responsible for the theft? So at this point, uh, there might have been severe pressure to recover the ten thousand dollar lost. They might have been. They might have tried to scare him. If supposedly they threat. They might have threatened to harm his wife. So um, his his wife and he made a public announcement to the same men uh, at the VFW that he was looking for a hitman to take care of his wife. <laughs> Maybe believing that if he said that, they wouldn't hurt the wife. That's weird. So anyway, then the $10,000 issue comes up with Linda maybe asking her parents for $10,000, which was mighty strange. All right. The question comes down here. Whether there was a meeting at that parking lot that these people that were slightly disreputable came down to talk with the brothers and Linda in the parking lot of Cumberland Farms. It may be that the brothers arrived first and they were waiting and then Mark I'm uh, sorry, Linda Silva attempted to negotiate, failed to convince them to wait for money. Then there was a retaliation. She was shot. They jump in and disappear. 
the brothers are standing there going, oh, crap. Supposedly, uh, there was a point where some, somebody heard him, somebody yelling, one man yelling at another, you shit, before getting into a vehicle. And they drive away. And there's a whole point, this is a whole point where the brothers have no alibis. And apparently, they, they, don't, they don't have alibis. And when they get home, what was said to the father was, when he arrives, one of, the brother, one of the brothers arrives at the VFW to inform the father that something has happened to his sister and he needs to go to his parents' house. This brother states, dad is going to shit, which is a very odd response. Not dad, oh my God, dad's going to, dad is going to shit. Why? That's something that when something went wrong, you say that. Not, not because some, somebody who you have no clue who did it killed your sister. It's a very weird comment. At the household, everybody seems to by his uh, throats. The father also makes statements that are odd if, as if he already knows the reason for her death. Except for the one sister and, and the, uh, her husband. Nobody in the family seemed terribly interested in solving the murder of Linda Silva and bringing her killer to justice. And that is absolutely true. Nobody was willing to talk to me particularly. Um, there's a lot, there were lots of arguments through the family. Out, both, both brothers refused to be polygraphed. And that's where I left the case, okay? Now, very interesting case. Now, here's what happened. So, you know, these are just, these are just, when you're looking at a case, what you're doing is trying to eliminate suspects and you're trying to focus leads. I talked to the police and I said, look, something weird is going on here, this whole drug issue, drug trade issue in the family. I'm not saying the family's involved in drug trade. I'm just saying there's a lot of suspicious stuff, especially with this guy here. Um, that's what I came up with when I was there. Now, that doesn't mean they did. This is what, that is a, not necessarily the scenario. And I, didn't, I only went into a little teeny piece of it. Believe me, there's a lot more that pushed me in the direction of saying it looked like she may have interfered with a problem that was going on with her brother, and she was trying to solve it, and she ended up being collateral damage. That was my belief. That was the most likely scenario. Now, doesn't mean it's the only scenario. So what happened? All right. Six, six and a half years after she was murdered, a man was arrested. His name was Paul Dubois. Uh, he was never really a suspect for all of those six years, interestingly enough. Now, suddenly he becomes a suspect, and you're like, what the heck? It turns out what happened It was... Prior to her murder, he had filed three abuse and neglect reports about his ex-wife with the Department of Social Services. Silva, age 47, investigated these, those allegations and declared them to be untrue. She also found that Dubois' repeated allegations about his ex-wife were harmful to their children. Still, Dubois uh, continued to battle with his ex-wife for uh, custody, visitation rights, until as recently as the October before her murder, which would be... When was she murdered? No, no, I'm blanking here. She was last October. Hmm, I guess they're talking about way in the future here. He was described by someone familiar with the case as obsessed with getting control over his kids. And I always find the person who's in, familiar with the case. Who the hell is a familiar person? And this is their opinion, which we have no idea is true or not. He was, he was obsessed. Well, you know, he's the dad of the children. Maybe he's got a reason to want his kids. It's kind of weird that you call it that obsession. So then he was arrested for her murder. He stands accused of shooting Silva in the head at 7.30 uh, p.m. on September 12th of 1996. All right. So now let me see if I can find the rest of the information on this case, which is this is where it gets so weird. All right. So now... This is another story that was written in the papers because when, when they arrested him, I was like, really? I, I'll tell you, I was rather shocked. Not, not because I can't be wrong that my theory, you know, is just a theory that at the time, the police were not looking at this guy. He was not considered a suspect and she was freaking out the two weeks before over something to do with brother and whatever else people said was going on, including her own family that was saying it was going on. So... Now this guy comes out of the blue, supposedly because he's annoyed that she 
Not she alone, mind you. Linda Silva was not alone responsible for the fact that he lost custody. It was the entire Department of Social Services. But here, here we go. So there was concerns that the jur jurors would not find Paul Dubois guilty. There were so many ifs in the case. But in her heart, she believes prosecutors proved his motives and he wanted to murder Silver for denying custody of the children. Now, I believe this is the, maybe the sister of somebody in the family. I really needed closure. She did. I would hate to think an innocent person is in prison for life. If you had any, she's not really sure about this because she doesn't want an innocent guy to be in prison. And she's saying that. One true old man who listened to the closing argument said he did not think the prosecutor proved that Dubois had committed the murder. I would hate to have my life in the hands of that jury, he said, asking that his name not be used. And this is my problem with the jury system. Holy God, this is one of the worst convictions I've ever seen in my life. And not just because I worked the case and not just because it could prove me wrong on my theory, but because there was no proof. Listen to what they convicted him on. A well-fleet man who also asked that his name not be used said the jury should have acquitted Dubois. I wouldn't have convicted him on circumstantial evidence, on testimony from a girlfriend who was jilted. Yes, the, the evidence came from a jilted girlfriend. And wait till you hear what it is. I'm going to hold off on that for a second. I think there was a lot of pressure on the jury, said the, uh, and the courtroom was packed with people from the Department of Social Services. So all her friends came out saying, oh, this guy killed her. So all the social service people were there saying, you got to do something about our friend being killed. I'm not saying he did not do it, but there is reasonable doubt you don't convict. Now, interesting, in the other case of uh, Krista Worthington, there's huge push that there's reasonable doubt that, that uh, McCowan did it, even though his DNA was there and his story is crap. There's huge doubt. But this guy, nobody's making a thing about it. You know, you know he's a white guy, eh, so you can't, get, you can't get the racial bias in there. And he's kind of a loser, so nobody really cares quite frankly. That's the way it works. He doesn't have an organization behind him saying, oh, and then and a big television you know, crew and all that stuff. So John Birch, Linda Silva's brother-in-law, had doubts too about whether Dubois was the right man because he was solidly in the camp of, this was a, this was a drug, as a hit by a drug gang gone bad, everything gone bad. But as the trial unfolded, he became convinced of his guilt. Well, this is according to whomever, but I'm not hearing good information. Now, Dubois had a chance to speak before his sentence, but he chose not to speak. The guy did not get up and say, it's not me, Birch said. It would be the most horrible thing in the world to have an innocent person in prison for this. But there's a lot of stuff we learned about him. I can tell you this guy's not a choir boy. No, he wasn't a choir boy. But there, what was the evidence that put him away? And let's see if I can find, um, I had, okay, where did it go? Hold on a second. Where'd it go? Okay, I wanna, I wanna tell you the actual evidence. Okay, where did it go? Hold on a second. Now, by the way, okay, here we go. All right, um, let me find it. Okay, um, in closing arguments, the prosecutor said a list was found in the home of Dubois' ex-girlfriend, implicating him with phrases such as, I've had it, I'm all done, and DSS caseworkers screened out. So it's the claim is from the, the caseworker people that screened out means the case is closed. And so he's based, they're trying to now say that he's saying the D DSS workers her case is closed because I killed her. There's absolutely nothing in this, this scribble that has anything to do with that. Um, they also, let's see, um, the lawyer, his lawyer, Segadelli, um, said that the jury disregarded the judge's instructions and went with a hunch. That's exactly true. I don't believe they had evidence to find him guilty, said Drew Segadelli, a foul mouth attorney. Foul mouth. Foul mouthed. Foul -mouthed. <laughs> I can't pronounce this one. I don't know how they say it up in uh, up in uh, Cape Cod. Falmouth? Falmouth. 
foul mouth, <laughs> foul mouth attorney. He might have been. He did contact me, and um, I couldn't. I, you know, I don't testify in court as a profiler because I don't believe it belongs there. So that was where it ended. Who represented Dubois? I don't think it was a fair victim. Uh, a, sorry, sorry, a fair verdict. So, essentially. Let me find the rest of the information. The public police never publicly specified what kind of gun was used to kill Silva. Uh, yeah, I know what kind of gun it was. It was a very, very popular gun. And the murder weapon was never found. So, so Dubois, the, there was no weapon in his house. They found a shotgun he had, but they never found a weapon that killed Linda Silva. So, Supposedly, some ex-girlfriend said she once saw this gun that looked like the gun. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is it. And she wrote something down on some toilet paper about the type of gun, but then I think she lost it. And so he got convicted because the wife, the, the ex-girlfriend at the time said that when he came, he was in town that night and he came back wet because it was raining. That's it. That was, that was the evidence against him. The evidence. That he had, that his girlfriend claimed he had a gun like the gun, and he was upset with the social worker, in general, the department. There was no, there were no witnesses. There is no nothing connecting him to the weapon that killed her. That's it. If you you're talking about almost no evidence, there was almost no evidence, and there was evidence that there was a whole thing going on with her and this, this whole this whole drug issue. There was lots of evidence there. So, to me, okay, I can't prove the other one either, but supposedly there was this thing going on with the ten thousand dollars, that and there was the the behaviors of the brothers that were very very unusual at the time. They did. I'm not saying they killed. Her. Her. The brothers didn't, but may have known what happened and why it happened. And they, I believe they may have been there in the parking lot with her at least, you know, when it happened. And there was the, the, st the things that were said afterwards to, you know, people heard, you know, and the comments to the family and the family's disinterest in finding out who killed her except for one person. I'm going to say still all the evidence leans toward that this was possibly a she was at collateral damage on a drug deal gone bad. Um, I see nothing that proves that Dubois did it. Could he have done it? Yeah, he could have. Maybe he did. But the problem is, this jury found him guilty on absolutely no evidence. <laughs> None. I mean, I, I'm still shocked. What evidence? What? That he wrote something down that you interpret to mean that he killed her or wanted to kill her? And that he, his girlfriend, jilted girlfriend, says, oh, yeah, he had a gun like the gun, which was like a 38. Actually, there's more to it than that. But, there, you know, just a gang, uh, any gun that any, any kind of low life might have. Could he have done it? Yes. Is there proof? No. I don't know how there has not been an appeal on this case, how he has not gotten out of prison. Um, Oh, it's one, but you know, you're never going to see a book on this, and you're never going to see a documentary on this because nobody cares about a low life guy that nothing there's no racism here involved it's just a low life that got convicted by a jury and i've had a number of a couple of cases which this it's similar problem it's like the guy's already a creep you know kind of a you know maybe a maybe a criminal even but it doesn't mean he did it and sometimes he's just an easy an easy you know fall guy for you know finally closing a case down and that's what I think happened here, and I, I find it rather appalling. So anyway, let me get to your comments. But it goes to show you how difficult these cases can be, that when you have all the diff different possibilities, suspects and scenarios, in theory, when you finally do find somebody who you believe did it, there should be substantial evidence to convict them in court. Uh, I think uh, McCowan had that. And, you know, I'm, I'm shocked that Dubois, I mean, you, you have, um, they couldn't convict um, uh, Casey, Casey Anthony. They couldn't convict O.J., but they can convict Dubois based on a jilted girlfriend saying she wrote something down on some toilet paper and he had a gun like the gun? Really? <laughs> that, that's, has, that's when you can convict somebody? That's quite appalling. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, the area she was shot right in the back. Yeah, she was, it was at a distance. There was, you know, somebody just shot her like that from a distance. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, if they were having an argument in the lot and one of the guys just, the, the guy, the bad guy just pulled out the gun and shot her down and they're like, oh crap. As I said, oh shit, is what was heard. Yeah, or it could have been Dubois who was stalking her perhaps, but nobody saw him stalking her. 
Nobody saw him in the lot. Nobody, you know, there's no, there's just no proof. So that's problematic. <laughs> that, that would be it. Totality of evidence was a note on a toilet paper and a witness statement. That, that was it. You got it. The toilet paper conviction. Yeah. Even if she was collateral damage, it seems odd the parents and family wouldn't cooperate. Yes, doesn't it? Um, if the brothers had nothing to do with anything, and, and I, I say they didn't kill her, but if they knew who was involved and they were involved in something they shouldn't have been involved in legally, they would not take a polygraph. Um, and they could have cleared themselves. Um, the family was very, they, they were for years, absolutely had no interest in having this case solved. And I think it's, you know, at the time, it certainly was because I thought there were, there were people from their family involved in things that maybe they shouldn't be. I can't prove that. I'm not saying they did. I, you know, I'll clear it up right here. So if, the, if somebody wants to come back now and say, you know, you're slandering our family. No, this, this came from, this information came from family members. Okay. It came from family members and it came from interviews I have with family members. And I've got, I've got the emails and all the documentation to prove it. I'm not saying that, that's, that they were or they weren't. I'm just saying this is information I was given at the time. And their behaviors were indeed suspicious. Um, yeah, especially because of the, yeah, except for the sister and her husband, it didn't seem like anybody really was interested in solving the crime, which was very peculiar from a family member. Um, <laughs> Doreen says, have you thought about writing a book about the need for professional juries? Oh, yeah, maybe I'll do that one day. Yeah, mm, that's a, you know, it's, I say I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, so I probably wouldn't get a lot of respect for, for writing the book. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, I've been harping on this for years. It, it, it seems so many times it's emotionally driven. You know, you're on the jury, and here comes this guy that looks like a lowlife, and he's up as a defendant for shooting this poor woman who's doing her job. And they made a big deal of this. She was doing her job as a social worker, and nobody should do their job to try to help children and be shot down for it. I mean, that 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 gets to you. You know, it's that's very heartfelt. That would upset me too. But there were other things going on in town, you know, that maybe were problematic, but they, they, they weren't hearing about those things. So, um, yeah, I, I think that is a great example. You know, even if, even if Dubois is guilty, even because this can happen too, in theory, if I'm ignoring the weird evidence that happened that night with the lack of alibis for the brothers, with what was the, the, the there was a, after she was shot, there was that comment, oh shit, you know, to, to somebody else. And then a, a vehicle sp sped away from a parking space, which was a family parking space, by the way. And um, at that point, uh, then there was the, the following stuff that went on. If you ignore all of that and just think that that was just coincidental and really was not what we think it is, um, could Dubois have committed this crime? Yes, he could have. He could have, you know, you could have had the bad guys from drug, drug, the mob down in town. You could have had Dubois down in town. The bad guys could have thought they're going to talk to this woman about what happened, you know, blah, blah, blah. Maybe they even had a meeting set up. But as she gets to her car, Paul Dubois jumps out and shoots her and runs away. And they get there and go, ah, oh, crap. <laughs> Well, we don't, have to take, we don't have to worry about her anymore or, you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, I'm just making up stuff. But it could have happened. Sometimes there's intersecting possible suspects and scenarios. But can you convict on that? And I'm shocked that they were able to convict Dubois. I, I don't understand it. I don't understand how he got convicted on such pitiful, pitiful evidence, even if he were guilty. It just oh, it's amazing. Um, uh, his, 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 his attorney was Drew Segadelli. Um, and I did talk to him, and I don't know why, you know, nothing was pursued after that. You know, you have to understand about defense attorneys. I mean, you know, um, this guy didn't have much money, so I'm going to say, you know, Sigadelli wasn't making a lot of cash. You know, and you have a lot of cases, so, you know, you, know, you, you have to decide which ones you want to waste your time on. I don't know that he cared that much, you know. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just don't care that much. And there wasn't, he wasn't get. everybody was against uh, uh, Dubois because they had all this, the social workers there, the family who wanted this case closed, even if it, they, you know, you have two people here saying 
we don't want an innocent guy in prison, but okay. So, you know, I think they still question it, but they just don't. You know, you get tired and you just want the stupid thing to end. You just want to believe it's over and you want that supposed closure. And if everybody else is going to go ahead with it, if the prosecution believes it's him and the jury decides it's him and the social workers decide it's him, hey, let's just decide it's him. You know, and so the, turn, the defense attorney is probably like, yeah, whatever, you know, I pick up my paycheck and go home. You know, so I don't think he's, you know, and again, who's going to be behind him? Do you think the Innocence Project is going to come out for this guy? I doubt it. It's not a, it's, it's, it, he's, he's in prison for life. It's, a, it's, it's not a death penalty case. It's not a DNA case. And he's not, he's white. And let's just face it. I mean, that's just not as, you know, except for, except for, you know, Stephen Avery, which I have no idea why there's such a big, you know, big fan club for that piece of crap. Oh, yes, I do. Uh, the the reason Stephen Avery on uh, the Netflix making a murder is so big is because the claim was that he got he was wrongly convicted, and so therefore you can get you can get at the state, you can get at the authorities by the wrong conviction, wrong. You know that that you can start something and then say and then they 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 railroaded him again. That's how it got its traction. So you know there's got to be some agenda behind it, not just not just the truth. So. Um, uh, there are Gretchen. I, I have forgotten. There are there are countries that use a, a a multiple judge system. So they'll have you know three judges, five judges, uh, and these are like professional jurors in a sense. Um, but no, I don't know if anybody's done, done a true professional jury system, which is what I would like. Like I would like people to be able to go to school and learn criminal profiling and crime scene uh, crime scene uh, analysis. Okay. And the law. This would be what they'd study. They'd study professional juror. And you'd come out with your degree as a professional juror. And therefore, you would have studied all these major issues. Um, and then when you were, then when the, the, you would be picked, you know, lottery system or whatever, you'd just be on the, on the list. You'd be picked to be the juror on one of these trials. So maybe there'd be five professional jurors. And all those would have had training and experience not just in one crime in their lifetime. Oh, look, you know, I've, you know, I'm a, I don't know what, let's say, you know, I'm an artist. Uh, and then one day, 30 years into my life, you know, as an adult, now I'm 50 years old, and, oh, I'm going to be on a jury for a murder. And my life has been spent creating art. <laughs> what the hell do I know? Unless I've watched CSI. You know, then I go in for my one crime of my lifetime, and I'm, tr I'm not trained. I know nothing about anything. And then I just listen to, these people, this dog and pony show by the prosecution and the defense, to convince me of one thing or the other, and then they bring the experts out to confuse the hell out of me, and then I just go, I don't know, but, you know, I don't know, I guess this, that's, that, and that's the way the jury system works. But if we had five professional jurors, at least they would, A, have training, and they, they would have done enough cases where they're not easily swayed. It's like, you know, once you've worked one case after the other, you know, it's not like, oh, I care about this one so much. It's like, okay, this is another case, and I have to analyze the evidence. And we have other people with training to analyze it with me. So it wouldn't be just me and a bunch of other, you know, people off the bus stop, as I always say, <laughs> 12 people off a bus stop. It's actually five people who've all been trained. Uh, I think that would, that would have a higher rate of, you know, success of proper uh, convictions. Uh, but there's a whole issue about jury of your peers crap, and I never knew who the jury of my peers is going to be. Who are they going to pick for my jury of my peers? You know, maybe I don't like that jury. <laughs> you know, they pick them out to be, I don't know, like me. I don't even know what that means. So, really, just professional judges. Yeah, they they have the judge system. I don't know if they have the juror system. So they have professional judges. The only thing I have about professional judges is that they're usually legally trained and not necessarily trained in criminal profiling and crime scene analysis. You know, I would want that. Like, I, I'm often fond of Ken Maines. Um, we don't always agree on, and we could be on a jury together and not agree. Let's say Ken Maines was a professional juror and I was a professional juror. You know, I'd like to have him as, as, as another person because he's very analytical and very logical. So if we had five of us, we would hopefully come to a proper conclusion together. And if we had to argue about things about the issues and say, hey, do we really know about those tails on that sperm? Or is that just something that's kind of like fishy that they're using that? Um, we'd be able to discuss it in, an, in, an, in a method that comes from people who have awareness of these things, not people who have not a clue. So, you know, uh, that's, 
say I've been fighting for this for years. It just bugs the heck out of me. Let's see. Um, Saiban, Saido, wait a minute. Let's see. Oh, this is interesting. Lisa says, Japan's mixed decision-making body of six lay citizens and three professional judges. Interesting. That's another concept. Although I don't know if it, it's an interesting of lay and professional together because, let's face it, um, okay, I love you guys because you, you're my people who are in the chat room, but let's face it, I, when, when I look at my comments sometimes on, um, on YouTube, people come in and say the most ridiculous things sometimes. I'm like, holy crap. So if those are the three lay people, I'd be really concerned that they're three lay people who've been watching uh, hundreds of hours of grifter channels and now have you know, 10 different suspects of the Delphi murder <laughs> or, you know, all the other cases. They just all of a sudden, well, it could be this. And you're like, no, we can't. You're illogical. <laughs> and you're listening to, go listening to gossip. So it depends who those three lay people are. And it still bothers me in the sense, you know, that they're not trained. Um, so I th that's why I think if you have enough, if you have enough professional jurors and they come through the system, you know, they're working as jurors. They're not working. They're not well, people could say they be, could be politically inclined, but, you know, um, I think if they're chosen, uh, you know, through a lottery system, you know, these are the professional jurors in the area. There's there's 50 of them, and we're picking these. And they actually get paid to go to, you know, go to work. Um, they're not like the poor, you know, civil, civ civilian juries who lose their jobs over this crap. And, uh, you know, most people try to get out of it because they don't want to get paid. What are they? I forgot what they pay now, 15 bucks a day or something outrageous. <laughs> Um, professional jurors will be very busy with the amount of crime we have. Yeah, well, yes and no. Um, a lot of the things are plea bargained at a low level, and they just or they just go before a judge and they just go, okay, we're giving you whatever. I'm talking about the big cases. Um, so the, I would say especially homicide. I think homicide should always be under professional juror system um, because these are the ones that get so tricky, and these are the ones that all the money is put into, and these are the ones that are decisions on somebody's life as opposed to you know did he still rob something from the, the store down the street i don't think we need a professional jury system for that but i do think when it gets up to the big the big big you know things that are going to be life sentences or death penalties i think at that point we could use some you know people with massive uh, a, a good amount of training shall we say um, let me see what else you've said i'm going to go backwards now um This is very true. Lisa says, then there are those criminals who have a need to have their crimes known and desire infamy for having committed them. Yeah, mass murderers, uh, definitely right when they do them. Uh, serial killers, uh, when they're already caught. You know, they don't want, they don't want to be, they're not going to give up their information before they're caught and convicted. <laughs> That's only afterwards because once you can't play one game anymore, then you change the game. And the new game is getting married in prison, having, you know, having conjugal sex because they allow that, having a baby, having a child born to you, even though you're a serial killer, it's disgusting. Um, the poor child has to grow up with that, you know, so you know whatever woman hooks up with a serial killer, she herself is a narcissistic piece of garbage. Um, and that would put her own child, oh, what's your, who's your child? Well, who's your daddy? Oh, it's Ted Bundy. Oh, great, you know, it's Charles Manson. Yeah, <laughs> that's pretty terrible. So essentially, you know, yeah, once, once they are already convicted, they'll go for books, mo movies, prison interviews. They'll get a, oh, sometimes, uh, you know, a fan club that tries to prove them innocent of things that clearly they did. You know, all that stuff goes on because it's a new game. You know, you're going to be in prison the rest of your life. You've got to have something to do. You know, I almost can't blame them. If I were a serial killer, I'd be playing that game too, you know. But the problem is we let them play that game. We let them have outside communications. We let them get married in prison. We let them do these things. And we have to stop doing that. If they're a serial killer, they should have no contact with the public, period, except for their lawyer. That's it. You know, I don't understand where, yeah, they get all this stuff, um, all these breaks. Um, I was like, oh, yeah, Bundy and Kemper. But a one-time murder rapist. Well, there's the site. First of all, generally speaking, most murderers are psychopaths. Um, one-time murders are usually. It depends if it's if it's a, a situational crime where somebody kills somebody because like they're the you know they're the baby daddy and they don't want to deal with the baby or the woman anymore and they get rid of her. 
it's, that's not a serial killer. That's a situational killer. He's still a psychopath, but, you know, yeah. Um, and he's actually more likely to confess if you, if you confront him than a serial killer would. A serial killer wants to keep killing, so he, he will only confess if it serves him a purpose in the long run. So, yeah. Fun, fun people. Hmm. Let's see. Um, let go back to the bottom here now. Let's see. Oh, Lord, that's an interesting thought, Lisa. Would love a follow-up report, a study of killers' children and how they turned out, which sheds some light on nature versus nurture. Well, you know, normally speaking, I don't think they come up as killers um, because their parents were killers. I mean, as far as I know, that's not true. Um, uh, you know, because they... But certainly they have to have a dysfunctional growing up. I mean, you know, oh, Mommy, why did you, why did you, why did you marry Daddy in prison when you already knew he killed 20 women? <laughs> You gotta get, she, that child is being raised by somebody who's psychologically sick. So she's already got, that baby already has a bad start, which is really, really sad, really sad. Yeah, I don't understand this either. Yeah, it's crazy to me that some prisons allow inmates to mate and procreate. Yeah, why? Do, it, here's what I don't understand. The people that you killed don't get to have sex and procreate. So why do you get to have sex and procreate? This makes zero sense to me. I, I, that's one of those things that angers me tremendously. Um, uh, this is true. Dennis Rader's daughter seems okay. Many of them write books. Yes, that's true. We don't know if she's okay. We don't. Um, her, her mother, well, first of all, wait, wait a minute here. Her mother didn't marry Dennis Rader after he was in prison. Theoretically, her mother didn't know Dennis Rader was who Dennis Rader was. Okay, um, so in case you don't understand who Dennis Rader was, let me just point this out. Den Dennis Rader was convicted of the uh, BTK killings in, in Wichita, Kansas. He's a serial killer. I will do a show on BTK. I do not believe Dennis Rader was the original BTK. I went out to Wichita to do a documentary on this, and I believe I, I have a pretty good clue of who was the original BTK. Uh, and I believe that he is not. I believe he is a serial killer. That I believe. But I believe he confessed to the B early BTK crimes because he was given a plea deal in which he didn't. He didn't. He got out of the death penalty murder that he committed, and therefore he only get life. You know, he confessed to anything at that point. So sure, I'll, I'll take. I'll, I'll take the earlier crimes. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of squirrely stuff that went on with that uh, fake hearing that was done. So it's, it's a very complicated case. So. Yeah, so I'm going to, uh, <laughs> and Lisa says, you said that, Pat. I'm very curious. Please do him this week. Okay, I have to go. Uh, I, I, I will look forward to doing that case. The, the problem I have with some of these, which is why I put them off, is because there's, I have so much information stored. And a lot of it is from years and years ago when I, when I worked on the case, when I went out there, when I... And it's so far back, and I have so much information that it, it takes a lot of, so my memory is beginning to suck. Like like this case with Linda Silva, I mean, you know, I had to, that's 20 years ago, so, you know, I had, that I went there. And so, you know, I still have memories of it, but I don't have as solid thoughts as I did back in the day when I was in the in the midst of it. As a matter of fact, it's pretty funny. Somebody was just, one of, one of, who asked me to do this one? Um. Was it k -Rab? Was it you who said about the Lake Okono? Or was it Lisa? Lake, the Lake Okono, Lake Okono murders um, in Georgia. Two elderly people, very wealthy people, were, were murdered in their home. Uh, he, the, the man was uh, killed in his home and is found headless. And, um, and uh, the wife was taken from the home and her body was found in the water. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, oh, okay, would you be interested in doing this crime? And I'm reading it going... I'm, and I'm starting to see a house appear, and then I'm seeing the lake appear, and I'm seeing a boat appear, and I'm like, what the heck? Why am I remembering all these things? And all of a sudden, I realized, I've worked on this case. And I'm like, but when? When, when did I do this? And now I have a vision of a camera in front of me. Like, I did this for a television show, because I actually, I, it's coming back to me now what my whole theory was. But I can't find one damn note on it. I've gone through my hard drives. I put my name into Google, Pat Brown, look, and nothing comes up. <laughs> I can't come up with a television show. I can't come up with notes. 
and to this I'm just driving me crazy I'm like I clearly worked on this you know not not for the police but I worked on this case either for television or for some other reason and because I knew all the details after, as I started going it was coming back to me like these flashbacks <laughs> I can't remember when I was doing it so yeah that's a, it is a problem I mean you know, I've worked on so many cases and 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 also just done you know television on so many cases um, that you know they all kind of start jumbling you know and I got to find stuff and think what did I think back then you know <laughs> so I got to really look for this so we'll find out um, uh, Martin says in the Krista Worthington case what do you think was the motive oh he's a rapist and well, two, two possibilities if he if he attacked her on if he if he it was okay the two I point pointed out were this either he had sex with her on Thursday and then after he got drunk or whatever he was doing at that party he came back it was Friday night party showed up at her house at midnight saying baby 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 let me have some you know and she came out going what the hell are you doing here he, well, I thought you'd like a little more. And she's like, get it out of here. And he got mad because she wouldn't give him more. And he ended up killing her and didn't have sex with her that night. Or maybe he killed her and had sex a second time with her. Who knows? Or, or the Thursday night, the Thursday thing never happened at all. And he went, he just had seen her. Um, you know, he had seen her before because he goes to the route. He knows she's alone in the house. So he, after the party, he goes over there and, and, and attacks her. Uh, so I, I don't know. It could be one of those two scenarios, and I don't know which one it was. But so so Steve says probably rejection might have been if he already had sex with her. Uh, but maybe he just he did. Maybe he's just a straight up you know a straight up sexual homicide that he went over there and decided he was going to have what he wanted. Hard to say. Um, and we don't have to. You don't you know, they don't always have to prove motive um, unless the case is so weak. Like in this case, they didn't have any evidence, so they just really stuck on motive as, as, as well, you know, he, he had a reason to kill her, therefore he must have done it. <laughs> you know, that, was their, that was their entire case. He had a reason, so he must have done it. Um, Pat, do you do a week, radio show weekly with Joe Salzone? Yeah, I do. Um, Joe, Joe and I go way, way back, so he called me up and said, hey, would you do like a weekly thing with me? I said, sure. I don't do much radio or TV anymore because I don't trust people. But I, you know, Joe Salzone's a good guy, and, I, and he's always been fair with me. Um, so therefore, I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll do it. It's kind of fun just to, just to hook up with Joe, and it's, you know, it's just a light, light-hearted crime thing. So it's usually 15 minutes, or you know, last week was five minutes because he ran out of time. <laughs> so we did a we did a short one. Mm. So it's just fun to do. Um, yeah, I, w I wish TV. Um, hadn't gone down the toilet the way it's gone down the toilet. I did enjoy doing TV, but this is so much better because I, if they had brought me on to talk about either one of these cases, um, I wouldn't have gotten to say much. So let's say they brought me on to talk about Krista Worthington and did I think that um, uh, McCowan was guilty. So here, here would be what happens. This is the way TV works. They call me up and they go, hey, Pat Brown, um, we want to do a thing on Krista Worthington and the guilt of uh, uh, of uh, Chris McCowan what do you think two things happen I go well you know the evidence is pretty strong that he's guilty and then they go oh, okay and then they come back about an hour later and go oh well, we won't be able to have you on we're, we're kind of short on time that means they didn't want me to come on and say I didn't think he was guilty or they go oh you don't think he was guilty why and they ask questions and they go okay well we'll see you we'll send a car for you blah 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 I end up on the show on a panel and the other three people are all saying he's not guilty and then they all attack me that's how television works and I think it's I think it's it's completely disrespectful I mean if you're gonna bring somebody on the show for their expertise I don't think you should bring them on the show just to attack them and what they would allow me to do when I got to the show was to say one sentence and then they would blow me away they go so Pat, you actually think that and then they go to somebody else and go so so Marty what do you think of, what do you think about Pat saying that he's guilty and then Marty goes well she obviously doesn't know what she's talking about <laughs> you know this is the way it goes and I'm like uh, uh, I'm done with that I want to go where I can explain and thoroughly explain. And if at the end of my thorough explanation, you disagree, well, you have that right. Uh, but I, I also, I don't want to fight with people. I don't, I don't want people coming in saying, you know, you're an idiot, blah, 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 blah. Um, not because I can't be wrong, but because it's just, it's just pointless. And um, having a proper discussion 
is a different thing. We have lost the ability to debate. Debating used to mean you under, you know, you took two people who understood their subject or whatever, and they also could understand the other person's point of view, and you debated things so that you could help people you know, look at all the possibilities. But that's not, we don't have a healthy debate method left anymore today. We just have, you know, vicious attacking. <laughs> so, um, has Rader stayed silent? Oh, I'm not sure. I missed. I must have missed what what was said back then. Uh, yeah, it's a true crime Tuesday, but it's out. Of, it's out of Ithaca, New York. So if you're not up there, you're not going to get the channel. That's why I put it on my Facebook page, and I also am putting it on our our posts. So I'll put I'll put our I'll put the radio show on the post every week so that you can you can see them. So I'll put them up. Um, Oh, let's see. Molly says, would you comment on Bundy pleading not guilty for many murders of rapes, but found guilty, so he played the game for a long time compared to Raider, who pleaded guilty and has stayed silent. Raider, want, see, the difference was Raider didn't want to go down for the death penalty. And as, as I said, that's a whole interesting thing about, I believe they fed him every bit of information he told uh, when he was in the courtroom. I already knew all that crap, and some of that crap was wrong. Um, but he wanted to get out of the death penalty. I also think they gave him a monetary thing for his wife. So, you know, so he got a deal. Uh, Ted Bundy wasn't getting so much of a deal, <laughs> you know, and anything he said was probably going to put him, you know, he was, he was guilty in a number of states and you now there was the death penalties waiting on his butt. So he had let more reason to be quiet in the beginning. And uh, D D Raider, once he took his plea, I guess doesn't feel the need to say anymore. So, you know, <laughs> Gretchen says, you're so right about the inability to debate. Too many keyboard warriors on social media. Yes, and, and the sad thing about it, too, is that there's a lot of, um, I, I can see this coming a mile away on, on, face, on, on like YouTube. Somebody will say something like, I really respect you, Pat. And then the next word is, but. <laughs> and then they trash me. So it's not a respectful thing. It isn't respect. They say they respect, but they don't respect. So it's like, you're on my channel. If you're on my channel, why are you even coming here if you don't want to learn from me? Even if you don't always agree, you know, I go, hmm, I'm not sure about that. I heard a little different from Ken Maines or I heard a little different from Dr. You know, Grande. That's okay. But when, it, when people come specifically to attack, this, is, this has just becomes a world of where people with some serious psychological problems come to feel important. It's almost like they're committing their crime right here by coming out and abusing and, and, and molesting and, and, and brutalizing someone because it makes them feel good. So I just, you know, I just block them from the channel. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I do. I've learned that a long time ago. I, you know, I'm not, not going to sit here and suffer because people, are, you know, people have psychological problems. But people who truly want to learn can ask me why, you know, like they could say, you know, I just, I just, like, I, uh, BTK, Ken Maines and I disagree on BTK. Um, he has his reasons, I have mine. Uh, and, and I think that would, you know, we're not in a court of law, so we're just giving our opinions from outside the case. And, and somebody could listen to both sides and, and see what, what they feel about that. And they don't have to dislike Ken Maines or dislike me. Um, and, you know, I, sometimes, like for Do Dr. Dr Todd Grande, um, Sometimes I'm like, you nailed it. You, that is so good. And I put the link below. And a couple times I've gone, don't agree. <laughs> but I don't dislike him. I don't have to attack him or tell you, say he's a terrible guy because he di I, I disagree with him one time. I'm sure he disagrees with me sometimes. And I hope that he keeps his uh, a nice, cordial, expert thing toward me as well. So that would be in a, in a, in a, in a perfect world. So, you know. <laughs> um, I can't remember that. Uh, did, didn't Bundy defend himself in his own trial? I'm not sure. Good question. Uh, I'm going to do a case. I'm waiting. This is a very, very tricky case. Um, as a case I did work on, um, and the guy that is going up for a second trial, the first trial was for, uh, uh, for abduction, a rape and attempted murder of a teenage girl, and um, he represented himself in the case. <laughs> and and it, was, it was pretty, it was pretty funny actually, because he he got up on the stand. I mean, he got the girl on the stand. This poor girl, she's a young teenage girl, and she had to face him. And he said, "You know, I didn't rape you." And she looked at him, and she goes, "Yes, you did." <laughs> he goes, "Oh." <laughs> 
And so, so it, had a, it had some pretty funny things that, that, that came up in that case. And then he had the gall to say he represented himself in the, um, in the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, well, the phase after which, you know, the, um, what's the word for it? <laughs> Jeez, I'm blanking now. Um, penalty phase. And uh, he already done such a bad job, they already had convicted him. But now he's in the penalty phase. What kind of penalty he's going to get? He had the gall to say to the jury, he goes, well, if I hadn't raped the girl, she, she wouldn't have gone back home <laughs> and not gotten back into school. <laughs> They're like, life plus 30. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you know, so pretty funny when they when they defend themselves because they think they're so damn smart. Um, you know, it, they it, they can get a lawyer, and it's clear that they should get a lawyer. Uh, I mean, there are cases when people defend themselves and can't afford a lawyer, you know, because they're expensive. But he, you know, he could have had a lawyer. Uh, you know, it's just some people they think they could they can sway by because they come off as intelligent and smart, and they can make jokes or whatever they think they can do. <laughs> it's pretty funny. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Uh, So it's a yes, Bundy ended up, uh, Benny says, yes, Bundy ended up defending himself as he kept refusing the lawyers who was appointed to defend him. Bundy was lousy at defending himself. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's, it's kind of amazing, you know. It's like, it, I can see sometimes the point, you know, you, you know, you look at the guy, you meet with your lawyer and you think he's an idiot. <laughs> okay, that happens and you go, yeah, I don't want you because you suck. You know, I could do better than you. and. And he might be able to do better, um, especially some of these uh, guys have become the, the guy I've just talked about. Um, he um, he is now up for another homicide charge, uh, but he has spent his time in prison being a jailhouse lawyer. And I've had people call me about him going, well, he's been helping my son. I'm like, oh, yeah, the psycho's helping your son. He's a jailhouse lawyer now. Right. But sometimes they get they actually have so much time to study they're not bad lawyers now obviously this fellow screwed up because he wasn't a jailhouse lawyer at the time he tried to defend himself in the first trial but he's been in prison for 20 years now and i'm curious whether he's going to represent himself in the second trial because <laughs> he's probably much better than he was the first time around so we'll we'll see but i'm going to talk about that i'm waiting for some information i said i would not go public on that case i I talked with the family members and with the defense attorney, and I said I would not go public on the case. I'm waiting for it to go to court, uh, and then I will, I will do that that case. And it's a fascinating case, um, but I won't speak about it till it actually goes to trial. And uh, I'm not sure when that's going to happen because it's already been like four or five months since the arrest. So I'm not sure, but anyway, uh, <laughs> Bundy looked and sounded good, but didn't have any true attorney skills. Well, you know, it was funny. Yeah. That, that, and that is funny. He was a law student. That's correct. He was actually a law student. So he probably thought he was better than he was. Um, you know, just because you're a law student doesn't mean you're a good lawyer. <laughs> Apparently, he got arrested before he could really, you know, apply his trade. So, hey, he found a way to apply his trade in his own court case. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So, oh my goodness. Anyway, um, so that was that's it for today. Um, I really wanted to bring these two cases to show you how complicated it can be sometimes. And then the question of after all these time, because it was I think four it was like a long time before they arrested um, who killed um, uh, who killed uh, uh, Linda Linda Silva or who they claim killed Linda Silva. As I say, I'm not too sure about that one. Uh, uh, Krista Worthington wasn't such a long time, but they had basically these cases. This case went this case went severely cold. Linda Silva case went cold for a long time. This case was only like four years before they came up with uh, McCowan with DNA issues. Um, and they had, I mean, he was there. At least they had him there in the beginning. And they actually had the guy they claim killed her uh, that was convicted. Um, he was there in the beginning. Um, so, you know, he, like he'd been, they knew who he was. It's just they didn't think he was the guy for ever until the ex-girlfriend ratted, ratted him out or claimed that he did it. So, Still don't know. I mean, I wish I wish if he you know he was the guy, they had actual evidence to convict him and wouldn't leave me thinking this is something squirrely going on here. But I don't think he should have been convicted, even if he was guilty. Uh, this is one of the few times I would say, not just because I worked the case and think otherwise, but just because I don't see where the evidence is. It drives me crazy. So, um, but very, very two very interesting cases. So, um, 
Uh, and I learned, I never, I didn't know about Krista Worthington case at all. So that was really interesting to me to see how that all turned out. But I'm curious whether McCowan is going to get himself another trial, you know. I wouldn't be surprised. So anyway, um, if you're new to the channel, you're still hanging around, please do like and subscribe and join Patreon if you want to be part of this wonderful chat room, which these people come to <laughs> and aren't, aren't a pain in the butt. So, I mean, I always enjoy, everybody who comes to the chat room now it's such a pleasure compared to the way it was before i went to patreon only live so it's worked out i i may have lost some sus subscribers over it um but i don't care i'd rather have a good community of people who are truly interested in learning and and, and education on profiling and crime scene analysis than a bunch of people just coming in to cause trouble you know I, you know, I'd rather have that. So it makes my day better, and I hope it makes your day better as well. So thank you for all being here. It's been sensational, and uh, I don't know what my thing is next week. I don't know if I can do the, the, the Raider thing yet. I'd have to look and see how much information I have to, to, to get through <laughs> to do that case. I will do it. I'm just not sure if it's going to be next week yet. But it may be. We'll find out. So see you next time. And... Uh, I got some hangouts this week, and I'm going to, uh, for those of you who want to come to the uh, the, um, the call-in, uh, <laughs> I have all the equipment now, so tomorrow's job is going to see, is to be, uh, I'm going to spend the day trying to see if the equipment works. We'll find out. And if it works, we'll do a Tuesday night, 7 o'clock call-in. But cross fingers, God knows, it's more electronics. Just love that stuff. Anyway, bye. Bye.